So we are so excited to have Shadi Tofig with us today. She is the Maternal and Infant Health Initiatives Director of the March of Dimes here in Arizona. And we are so excited to have her talking to us today about child and adolescent health in global settings. As you know, um, as learners or um, physician educators, clinicians, any kind of health science, we are working more and more with those that don't speak our language or that live in another country and they're here um, and we're working with them or maybe you're traveling someplace and working with patients from someplace else. So it's very, very important work that Shadi is doing and important information that we're going to get today about maternal and child health. Thank you so much for being here, Shadi. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Creighton University for inviting me. Um, before we get started for today's session on child and adolescent health and, and global settings, um, I thought I'd just give you a quick introduction as to who I am. I have been working in the reproductive, maternal, neonatal, child, adolescent health and rights for close to 15 years, both domestically and globally in humanitarian emergency response and development settings. Um, I have, my expertise is in um, developing global guidelines and also designing and implementing and managing programs in humanitarian and um, development settings and also here in uh, the United States. I have field experience in Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, working with multiple government systems in addition to bilateral organizations such as the United Nations or WHO, um, international nonprofits or NGOs, and um, local community-based organizations and partners in the field. And by the way, that's a photo of me in the Nepal humanitarian emergency response in a very remote village. We, flo we flew in by helicopter for, um, to provide emergency services and I'm providing a birth kit to a very young adolescent woman um, who's pregnant again. These are some of the organizations that I have worked with previously before joining March of Dimes as the Maternal Infant Health Director for the state of Arizona. As you can see, I have worked with a lot of international nonprofits that um, work in the different regions across um, the globe. But I'm also a member of the Interagency Working Group for Reproductive Health in Crisis. Um, this, there's a steering committee of 20 prominent um, global organizations. Most of them are on here, plus the additional bilateral organizations um, with thousands of individual members like myself who participate in developing global guidelines or resources and develop evidence-based practices for field practitioners who are in the ground in an emergency response setting. Um, unfortunately, uh, reproductive health, maternal and child health or adolescent health isn't funded as much as it should be compared to, let's say, uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. So today um, we're going to provide you a high level overview of the sustainable development goals. Um, provide some context as to where we are in adolescent and child health, what are the disparities, um, what needs to be corrected. We're going to discuss some of the key determinants of health and also strategies to mitigate some of these poor health outcomes that we see in low middle, um, middle income countries. Some of the acronyms that I will be using throughout uh, the next 40 minutes or so, um, you have MNCH, which stands for Maternal, Neonatal, 
and child health. There's also reproductive maternal, neonatal, child and adolescent health. So RMNCH, adolescent SRH or ASRH, adolescent sexual and reproductive health, um, SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights. The SDGs are also known as the Sustainable Development Goals, non-communicable diseases, neglect the tropical disease for NTD, and then gender-based violence and more. A lot of these terminologies are interchangeable for the most part, especially around SRH and maternal health. Um, so bear with me, and if you do ever go out in the field, um, you're going to come across a lot of different acronyms and terminologies, and it's just a way of life. Sometimes in one sentence, I've written three different acronyms in an email to partners. So it's just the way that it is in our world of um, public health overseas. Um, so why are we focusing on global health? Um, health is used as a proxy measure, but we know uh, for the general well-being and development of humans in our society, of all people in our society. And why is that? We recognize that um, health plays a key fundamental role in ensuring that if someone is sick, if a child is sick, they're not going to access school. Or if you have a young adolescent um, and they haven't received any literacy or education, they're not going to be able to go into the workforce as such. And so health is known to be a fundamental prerequisite um, for a global functioning world that we want to live in. Um, and in order for us to understand um, what we need to know, we need to decipher where are we making progress, where are we challenged, and where is the progress um, uneven, not only in terms of geography, but also subsections of health, because we have maternal health, we have perinatal mental health, uh, we have nutrition and so forth. These are the sustainable development goals, the 2030 goals. It's a global framework that all members, member countries of the United Nations have signed onto. It's a call to action or a blueprint to eradicate poverty, um, inequality, and promote justice, health, and prosperity for everyone. The motto for the Sustainable Development Goals is that no one is left behind. Um, there are 17 goals. It starts with no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and last but not least, partnerships for, for all of the goals. This cannot be done without multi-sector partnerships at all levels of the socioeconomic model, and I will show you a graphic on um, that in a couple of minutes. We will focus today on good health and well being, so SDG 3, but child and adolescent rights are embedded in all of these um, sustainable development goals. There can be no improvements as a society without investing in our children and our adolescents. So, as I had mentioned, there are 17 sustainable development goals. Um, at least 10 of the SDGs have health-related indicators. Um, 50 of, more than 50 of those indicators are related to health outcomes and the social determinants of health services. Um, and at least 12 of the sustainable development goals have 48 direct child-related indicators. And we'll just get to some of them in just a bit. So these are the targets for um, SDG3 to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Um, there are 13 on here. I'm not going to read through them all, but I'll just highlight some key points. You'll see that all of them 
in some shape or form are related to child health. It covers reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health. It includes non-communicable non diseases, um, road traffic accidents. Road traffic accidents, surprisingly, is the number one cause for child mortality in the world. Um, it also includes universal access to health coverage, but also sexual and reproductive health and rights, just to name a few. So it's extremely comprehensive, it is complex, and you'll see in just a moment, it's not easy to eradicate these outcomes and ensure prosperity for all. These are the key indicators related to child health by the um, UNICEF, which is the primary um, branch of the United Nations responsible for monitoring child health and well-being across the globe. Um, we have maternal mortality ratio, proportions of birth attended by a skilled health personnel is important, under five mortality rate, neonatal mortality rate. Um, we need to estimate the incident rate of uh, new HIV infections, malaria incidents, adolescent birth rates, which is extremely important, proportion of the target population covered by essential health services in each country, um, and then the mortality rate attributed to house and ambient air pollution and proportion of the target population covered by all vaccines included in their national health program. So where are we today? 2030 is literally around the, around the corner, 5.5 5 years from now. And it's quite startling because of COVID um, and a lot of conflict that has arisen around the world there's compounding factors that are mitigating progress. Um, so there's a mixed bag, um, but let's celebrate some of the progress that has been made. Um, assisted childbirth by a skilled birth attendant has increased from 81% to 86% between 2015 and 22. 146 out of 200, uh, 200 countries or areas are on track to have already met the SDG target for under five mortality. Effective HIV treatment has cut global AIDS-related deaths by 52% since 2010. At least one neglected tropical disease has been eliminated in 47 countries. And there's been a falling adolescent birth rate and rise to um, access and contraception. Um, so there's, their needs have been met. So the adolescent birth rate for Older adolescents, so that's another terminology, older adolescents are defined by 15 to 19 versus younger adolescents are 10 to 14. So both have decreased. So for older adolescents, it's decreased from 47.2 to 41.3 births per 1,000, and then 1.5 births per 1,000, uh, 1.8 per 1.5 um, for younger adolescents. We also have, I had alluded to this earlier, there's um, complexities around the, the lack of progress in achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, while it is important to note that we do have skilled birth attendants increase in that workforce, maternal mortality is still on the rise. 800 women die every day from pregnancy or childbirth related um, issues. In the United States, every day, two women die from pregnancy preventable death. Let that sink in. And we in the United States are supposed to be the most powerful country, most economically powerful country in the world. And we're failing our women every day and our mothers. Uh, access to skilled birth attendants and health workforce overall, other than skilled birth attendants, is still really low. We need to have a functioning health system, um, and so that needs to be strengthened overall. And the highest burden is in the low to middle income countries um, in the global south predominantly. Expanding universal health coverage is 
far from um, where we want it to be. And unfortunately, it does have an outcome in terms of economic input or outputs. Um, 381 million people are pushed further to extreme poverty in 2019 due to out-of-pocket ex health expenses. Childhood vaccinations um, since COVID-19 um, have significantly declined and communicable diseases such as HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis are off track um, to meet their target due to all these intersecting crises. This is um, a graphic designed by UNICEF and the Sustainable Development Goal report as of 23 indicating, it's just a snapshot. It's not of all the indicators. Let me see if I can get this pointer to work. Okay, I'm just gonna walk up here. Um, these are some of the indicators for sustainable development. Three, it's not a comprehensive list, of course, but you can see right here, how far are we from meeting our target? Um, we're not close at all for any of them, even for the skilled birth attendant. It says it's close to target, um, but if you, oh no, how do I? Okay. Oh. Okay. Are you trying to go forward? I was no 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 no. I was just trying to use the pointer. That's okay. I'll just point with my finger. It looks challenging. It's okay. Okay. Um so yes, increased skilled birth attendance were somewhat close, but as we mentioned, maternal mortality is still on the rise. But because of all of these health constraints, workforce shortages are increasing um, and we're starting to go backwards. So for skilled birth attendance, we're going backwards, even though there's been an um, increase in reducing infant mortality, which is fantastic. Um, there's Acceleration um, is needed, but there is a high chance of going backwards. There's been limited to no progress on um, malaria epidemic and um, increased vaccination. We're in the red zone right there, um, and we're definitely going backwards there too. So really uh, 2020 was a pivotal moment, not only because of the pandemic, but also um, we've gone into war in several regions of the world. Um, so let's look at the sustainable development goals and measure it um, towards child, uh, ch children's well-being. Um, as mentioned, there are compounding crises um, and then a bleak economic forecast and the lingering effects of COVID-19. Overall, for all of the 17 sustainable development goals, only 15% of those SDGs are on track. 48% um, are moderately or severely off track, and 37% um, have stagnated or regressed. What does this mean for children? Uh, by 2030, only one in four children will live in countries where 70% of child-related sustainable development goal targets will be met. If progress continues, only 60 countries, home to 25% of child population, will meet their targets. So that there's that inequality there. That leaves around 1.9 billion children in 140 countries behind. Two and three child-related SDG targets are um, either require acceleration, so further resources, not only in terms of funding, but also um, human resources and initiatives. Um, and, or they're not being met at all. And so there does need to be among the global community a significant shift. Uh, the United Nations has published a report to help um, facilitate with their member um, countries, the United States is one of them, um, to mitigate some of these core issues. 
um, but it doesn't look likely that we will meet any of the um, significant targets by 2030. Does that mean we need to stop? No, there are plenty of people um, here in the United States and across the world that need um, healthcare and access to services. Okay, so I just wanna go back to terminology because I am going to delve into a little bit more around statistics on um, in relation to childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood. And you'll see when I pull up those statistics that they're used interchangeably. And so we'll need to know when we say children, we mean from zero to 18 years. Um, when we say adolescence, it's 10 to 19 years. Young people is 10 to 24 years and so forth. And young adulthood is up to 20, uh, close to 25. So we have um, half of the world's population is coming to age. And you can see on the map right here in Sub-Saharan Africa and in parts of um, Southeast Asia and into the Middle East and also in Latin America and Central America, um, that's predominantly where the child, like child and adolescent populations or young adult population is until 35 years of age. Um, we have 7.2 billion people worldwide, 2.4 billion children are under the age of 18. 3 billion are younger than 25 years, and that makes up 42% of the world's population. One point eight billion adolescents, ten to nineteen, will continue to increase into twenty fifty. Are we setting up our children for success around the world? Nearly nine out of ten adolescents live in low and middle income countries. So that's where the inequities are. Um, the funds are not um, countries, low income countries don't have the funds to support their communities, and so there's that injustice. So let's go through some of these statistics. Um, what are some of the facts and figures? Let's like delve into them a little bit more. We know that children are vulnerable to adverse health effects from indoor and outdoor air pollution, uh, which causes an estimated of 7 million deaths per year. There are 124 million children and adolescents affected by obesity in 2016. One billion children are exposed to violence every year. Over 240 million children are at risk of not meeting their developmental potential. Worldwide, about 43.3 million children are displaced as a consequence of conflict and violence. 43.3 million children as a consequence of violence and um, war. Worldwide, 3.8 million children live in internal displacement as a consequence of natural disasters. So climate change, global warming is on the rise. Um, and in countries in Northern Africa, there are droughts going on in particular in South Sudan, for example. Um, so it's going to cause uh, mass migration. Uh, one in four children aged seven to nine years feel lonely more frequently during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this was from a population in Europe. Uh, an estimated 6.2 million children and adolescents under the age of 15 years died mostly of preventable causes. Of these deaths, 5.3 million occurred in the first five years with almost half of these in the first month of life. So when we talk about, well, child visits or newborn visits, um, it's not only important here because infant mortality, the CDC published just um, last year in November, uh, infant mortality, while it had decreased in, the, um, in 21 in previous years, in 22 it had increased. Um, so infant mortality is even on the rise here in the United States, let alone globally. I just... um, but predominantly, when we talk about 
the inequities, where are they happening most in the world? Predominantly in Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of um, the proportion of child deaths. Um, and then we know that nutrition related factors are, also contribute to 45% of deaths in children under uh, five years of age. So ensuring that there's economic justice, moving people out of poverty, um, economic empowerment and innovation is extremely important. This slide provides more uh, reproductive health and rights statistics related to child and adolescent health. Um, the United Nations um, Population Fund is predominantly responsible for um, women's, women of reproductive health and rights um, for their, for their um, programming and initiatives across the world. So they measure this progress predominantly with UNICEF and the World Health Organization. Every year, approximately 16 million girls aged 15 to 19, so older adolescents, and 2.5 million girls under 16 years um, give birth in developing regions. In low-income countries, the adolescent birth rate is 6.5 times higher compared to the rates in more developed countries. And so if you don't have a skilled birth attendant or you don't have a hospital nearby or a primary health care clinic with a birthing facility, um, birth outcomes are going to be poor and um, it can be quite detrimental, clearly. More than 1.4 women or 27% of women in low income countries give birth before they are 18 years of age. This represents an estimated of 12 women in the least developed countries that, de um, that delivered babies during their adolescent years. And it's not far removed. I come from a family lineage myself. I was born into a refugee family. I was also born um, in a country that didn't recognize my birthright. And so I was without citizenship until I was two years of age. Um, and, but thinking back to, you know, my grandmother, she gave birth as an adolescent. She had a child marriage. Uh, she gave birth to six children before she was um, 22 years of age. So it's not that far off um, that this is happening on a daily basis. Globally, about one in six adolescent girls are currently married or in a union. Um, in the least developed countries, around 40% of women were married before 18 and 12% of women were married before 15 years of age. Every year, approximately 3.9 million girls, um, so older adolescents, undergo unsafe abortions. There's that fear and stigma. Sometimes they're raped. Um, religious reasons, they don't, family stigma, et cetera, they're not going to come forward. And so I've seen this overseas, let's say Myanmar, for example, I've seen adolescent women and also women, uh, young adults at the age of 25 come in because they've sticked um, leads and bark to expel the pregnancy out of fear. Post-abortion care services, post-abortion care is a signal function of emergency obstetric services um, by the World Health Organization. It's an emergency um, and thankfully it is implemented in majority of countries across the globe, especially in low income and um, middle income countries. In the United States, given that Roe has um, been retracted, unfortunately, as physicians, OBs are understandably quite concerned. When does it put risk to the health of the mother to when they can perform that post-abortion care service or for medical indications? So those are all related to those signal functions of emergency obstetric care that are in jeopardy here in the United States. Um, harmful practices such as uh, child marriage, um, still childhood of 15 million girls under the age of 18. 
So what does that mean? A young adolescent girl gets married. She starts to have babies. She's not in school. She can't um, have a job. She's not able to fulfill her dreams. Um, and she's raising children and she herself is a child. One in five women and girls under the age of 50 will have experienced physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner within the last 12 months. And this is by UN Women. In conflict settings and natural disasters or mass mig migration, um, violence against women increases exponentially because they're at their most vulnerable time. There are no protections. Um, and it and it's quite detrimental to their health. So when we think about all of these statistics, they're not just statistics. I can talk about plenty of stories, but I really just wanted to hone in how prevalent and poor um, our health outcomes are and our protection outcomes are for young um, women and children and adolescents. So, this graphic illustrates the life course uh, for protection and vulnerability factors that intersect with the well being of children and adolescents. Um, and we know that the vulnerability factors begin before birth with mothers. We need to increase access to care and protection for females um, while um, they're pregnant. Um, maternal mental health is also important. We see that the economic livelihood constraints and exposure to gender, physical, sexual, and psychological um, after birth are progressing throughout the lifespan right here. But we also know, based on the research, that the protection factors that are outlined at the top can really mitigate these issues in red. And it has worked. Thankfully, with the SDGs, the rights of the child are in theory recognized. Um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child was ratified in 1995, so just a couple of decades. Um, but it, it was ratified as a treaty um, which all countries except for the United States have signed onto. The United States does not sign onto um, any UN treaties. It's just been uh, a part of their diplomatic um, strategy from day one. And I believe that's attributed to our constitution. Um, but anyways, um, what does the treaty ratify? It ensures that every child has the right to be healthy, safe, and sustain and has a sustainable future, as well as the right to be heard on issues and decisions that will affect their future. So where, where do, how do we link child health and rights? Um, the ICPD, International Conference on Population and Development, in 94 um, indicates, and this is, you'll see the first sentence. This is part of WHO's constitution, the first sentence right here. A state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in all matters related to the reproductive systems and its functions and processes. This implies that people are able to have satisfying and safe sex and that they have the capability to reproduce and the freedom to decide if, when, and how often they do so. And the World Health Organization in 2006 has defined SRHR as sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence, for sexual health to be attained and maintained, the sexual rights of all persons must be respected, protected, and fulfilled. And I just wanted to go back here 
You'll see at the top of the protective factors, universal access to sexual reproductive health care is important. Also, education is important, empowering um, young individuals to be resilient and make informed decisions um, is their rights. And it saves lives in terms of um, mitigating early pregnancies. I'm sure you've all heard about healthy timing, healthy spacing. Um, that is something that we, it's a terminology that we use quite frequently overseas in terms of um, ensuring that there's at least two years before um, folks become pregnant again. In terms of um, child and adolescent programming, there are six domains. Um, they're here in this graphic, but well being is truly defined by, um, and this was agreed by young people and experts across the world. Um, can be achieved when adolescents thrive and are able to achieve their full, their full potential. Um, and this involves the six domains. It includes having good health, both physical and mental health, um, access to good nutrition and education, employability, connectedness, resilience, safety, and security, and protection from violence. Do we see that? When we talk about um, child and adolescent programming, um, do we believe that all children and adolescent needs are the same? We know that we're not, they're not a homogeneous group, right? Children and adolescents, as we saw in that graphic that I showed you earlier, there's very young adolescents, older adolescents, and in the span of their life, um, their needs are going to be different based on their age group. And so it's important when you're designing a program to meet their needs that you engage them directly um, and ensure that um, their needs are met and that these factors are all considered into your program design. Um, and so this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of the ecological model where we have to start with the adolescents themselves. Um, throughout the program cycle to have them involved in every step of the way. So if you're doing a needs assessment, include them in the design of that need assessment. Um, if you're going to conduct a training, include them in that training. Um, have them as master trainers to train their peers on different health topics, for example. Um, the ecological model, I, I love this model because it really demonstrates that everything, all different levers of our ecosystem have to work um, interconnectedly and synergistically in order to ensure that the, um, our community is healthy. Um, so yes, we have to apply the child rights approach to programming throughout the program cycle for all of the SDGs um, with partners, with both children and adults, so even with their parents. And I'll explain, I did this in um, Nepal a while ago. Um, and through specific and targeted interventions through a child rights lens. And when we talk about partners, I'm also talking about, when we're talking about enabling environment, policies, laws, and regulations are really important. So for example, in, in 2015, we had the emergency response in Nepal due to the 7.8 earthquake. Um, at that time, there was not a law in place for clinical management of rape for children and women. Thankfully, the um, local community, in addition to the international community, so UNFPA and um, the steering committee for, for reproductive health and rights, we all advocated with the government to 
not only provide those clinical guidelines, but also legal language to ensure that it's ratified that these services can be provided. Uh, clinical management rape or CMR, if I say CMR in just a minute, um, are provided. And it took a concerted effort for all partners because we started at the advocacy level with youth-based organizations, um, with multilateral organizations, community-based organizations, different government line agencies to enact this change. And it was one of the most unique opportunities ever because we have not seen in the middle of an emergency response um, for a policy related to the reproductive rights of children and women um, to be enacted so fast. Um, and we know in humanitarian settings that um, the rates of violence increase quite significantly. And as a result, I was out in the fields in one of the um, the villages and I was called in to the hospital because there was a very young adolescent, she was only 10 years of age, on her way to school, she was raped. And the organization that I was working with, we had just completed the clinical management of rape training for healthcare providers in the district that she was living, but we had to transport her for four or five hours to get to that facility to receive that emergency response care. Not only then, her rights were also violated because the local papers got a hold of this story and published it. But she had the right to remain anonymous. And so more advocacy and work had to be done with news agencies to respect the rights of children. But we all worked in terms of passing the policy, implementing the necessary trainings for healthcare providers, ensuring that the referral pathways were in place um, so that she and others could access the care that they need, even though the time the time factor is a little bit longer. I had alluded to this a little bit earlier, investing in children in health and education while being is not, um, is lagging, um, but the dividends are real. If we invest in children, if we invest in women, the outcomes are significant. Each dollar invested in health brings 20 times that in benefit in lower to middle income countries. Um, especially when invested in children, there's a benefit around uh, 10 to 20, uh, depending on what the intervention is. Um, as I was talking about, these are some of the initiatives that were quite comprehensive in nature, where we worked with children and adolescents, both very young adolescents and older adolescents, um, to enact change and to ensure that their needs are met. So not only did we target this issue through policy change, we also did it by building or reconstructing primary healthcare facilities to have birthing centers. Um, we conducted GBV programming and reproductive health training and, edu and um, education, peer education for very young adolescents and older adolescents to understand their bodies and what change is happening, um, but also education and training for healthcare providers, both on like um, neonatal obstetric healthcare services for the physicians, as well as clinical management of rape, um, but also family planning and contraceptive services. Um, we also didn't, we also had interventions out in the community through their school systems, uh, to ensure that they felt safe and their needs were being met. And we had adolescent friendly environments for them. So that provided more of a um, protective factor versus being wider out in the community, not being um, supported by local leaders. And I, as I mentioned earlier, menstrual hygiene management and the school health program uh, was quite significant there too. So what are the key messages? 
Does anyone want to read these out or should I read them out? What are our key takeaways? Early child and adolescent, has, every child and adolescent has the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Invested in child and adolescent health is essential to attaining the sustainable development goals. Uh, strong health systems and policies prioritizing children and adolescents are necessary for universal health coverage. Um, addressing social determinants are essential for reducing disparities. Again, the SDGs all have to work together. They're all drivers of health. Um, collaborating among governments and civil society, as well as academia and community-based organizations um, and other organizations are all vital in advancing the health and well-being of children and adolescents in our communities. That is it. Questions? Go ahead. Thank you so much, Shadi. We're going to use a microphone so people on Zoom can hear. And then we do have a couple questions in the chat as well. OK. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and presenting. Um, one question that I did have was, I just wanted to know, like, especially when dealing with um, different communities with different cultures, um, mm. what do you find? what are the biggest challenges in terms of working with these communities in terms of the cultural barriers and trying to enact change in these communities? Yeah, um, every culture is different. We have to study that culture, immerse ourselves in that culture. Like for, for anyone as a public health practitioner going into a country, you are a guest. You have to gain their trust um, and immerse yourself into that culture. And there is that colonialism. I, I didn't touch on this today, but um, that's a completely different subject matter. But really, if you, in order to enact change, it's up to the local governments to lead with us just providing the support from the periphery. It's their, it's their initiative. We're only here to provide support as needed. If you're talking about more like conservative cultures, um, different practices, like let's say like Pakistan, for example, you, you would think family planning, um, Programming would be, it is challenging, but we've made great strides in Pakistan in terms of um, contraceptive access, both in terms of um, postpartum contraceptive methods acceptance, but also um, among some adolescents. And so there, there are programs with, let's say, Pathfinder, for example, um, or IPASS, where we we work with religious leaders to find where in the Quran, for example, would allow access for contraceptive care. And then we together develop educational materials that are culturally sensitive, age appropriate, um, and have the religious leaders or the community leaders take charge and lead those conversations, not only with women, but men. I know today I spoke a lot about women, but we cannot forget the boys and men in our community either. Yeah. Connected to that was a question in the chat about contraceptives. Um, is there a certain age that you would not give an adolescent um, female a contraceptive or um, because yeah. I think what they were trying to say was, you know, for for other countries, every country, there's a different age of when it's appropriate to get married or appropriate um, to have relationships. So how do you draw that line of when it's okay to share that with adolescents? Okay, so one thing, I myself, as a reproductive health expert, when I'm in country, I do not have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with um, the population that 
we're aiming to serve. Um, it's really up to the healthcare providers and what the laws and regulations are of that country. Um, I'm trying to think back to Indonesia because I believe this did come up in Indonesia and um, yes, in some countries such as Indonesia, contraception isn't provided for adolescents. Whereas in Bangladesh, surprisingly, um, if an adolescent does come to the facility and request contraceptive services, they may receive it. Child autonomy in the, um, the child, let me go back. The Convention on the Rights for the Child, they have the autonomy to make their own decision without coercion or consent from an adult. That's the international standard, but again, depending on the laws and regulations of the country, it may differ. And it also depends on, is the country ready or do we need as health practitioners to start laying down the groundwork to alleviate some of those um, constraints on child health and adolescent health? It takes years, it doesn't happen overnight. Thank you for that. I'm going to try to remember um, all the questions, but another one was um, curious about the vaccine decline, mm -hmm. because it seems like vaccines is just a basic starting point when sharing help or resources with people in other countries. So what do you think that decline is from? Is it because of resources or people's choice? It's a mixture of both. People are not accessing their postpartum services or their infant wild, uh, well child visits. Um, and that's the entry point to advocate for vaccines. Um, so there is that delay. Um, and when you're in a conflict setting or you're, there's like mass migration, vaccines is not the number one issue families and mothers and fathers are concerned with as such. Um, but there's also a lot of misinformation now in the world in terms of um, the importance of vaccines. Go ahead. Oh, here, let me give you this. And I know we might be out of time. Um, I'm here. And it might not apply to your specific practice but if you could speak to the role of um, peer education, mm -hmm. community health navigators yeah. in the future of maternal and child health. They are essential. Just as doulas are essential to birth outcomes here in the United States, peer educators are also essential in educating adolescents, um, but also young women in their health and education and like general rights and what they um, kind of take. In, in all of the countries that I've gone to, peer education has been one of the um, promising practices in terms of reducing poor health outcomes. Do you see that as a formal or an informal approach? Like, are you training these peer educators? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because in a lot of countries, there might be traditional birth attendants as such. Um, and they have not had any formal education, but they were trusted in the community, their elders predominantly. Um, and while we respect the cultural influences, um, if health services are available, let, let's educate those peer educators or the traditional birth attendants. Um, and they can help increase access instead of having home deliveries, have deliveries in the healthcare facilities. 